And now, ladies and gentlemen, if I say Ada, you say Solomon, definitely, with applause. One more time, Ada Solomon on the stage as the moderator of the next panel session. And please join Ada here on the stage with a huge applause. Agnieszka Holland uh, is here with us. Happy to have you here, and uh, Agnieszka, as I believe you are straight from the airport. Yes. And uh, so how was your flight? Short. I came from Warsaw. Okay, okay. And so directly the jet lag is still... But I came from Korea and Israel uh, yesterday, so yeah, I'm on jet lag. So you have to forgive me my slowness. We absolutely forgive you, and uh, uh, it, it's very interesting how you checked which, which place is better to sit, and <laughs> who got the next one, we're going to see, well, but we know. They, they are all pretty soft, you know. Yeah, so and, and, and... I didn't want any feather, maybe you try for me I'm going to try it for you, so it's... Uh, it's I believe all of them are like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but just, just enjoy, just enjoy. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we are taking the applause and ovations because Julie Baines, Dan Films Limited, please, with applause. United Kingdom. And we know already that everything is soft here. Is it Don't even say that word. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, we are continuing to join the crowd here. Katriel Shuri, Israel. <laughs> and you are coming with your microphone already. Happy, <laughs> happy to have you here. I have somehow the sense like in the Eurovision, 12 points goes to Israel and the all song contest feelings here. And Shelley Page, uh, UK, with applause please. And uh, Shelley, it's so interesting, uh, I'm also doing like rehearsals at home and speaking through the program. And uh, I, was, I was reading through the program and my daughter, which is precisely three years old, was very interested on the motif, how to train your dragon and uh, other animations you have behind. So one more time with applause, all our panel speakers here. And the issue you are discussing is how to get a small country product into the big market. So I believe it will be intense, interesting, and uh, Ada, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'll do my best. I think my voice is getting better. Thanks. Latvia, it's the weather. <laughs> um, and the, the, the very warm welcome that I got here. That's, that's why I'm getting my voice back. So, we will jump on, on this very quickly. Um, and actually, I've, I've been thinking that we better speak about more personal inputs about what means being small and to get big and what do we understand from what's small, what's big, what's the resonance of this. Because Agnieszka, for instance, you are not coming from a small country, you are coming maybe from a small circulation language in terms of... Uh, coverance, but it's not a small country, it's a big country, Poland, it's a big country, and uh, your achievements are fantastic on all levels, and uh, I was thinking a lot of you uh, the other day when, uh, when I heard that my favorite for the moment uh, woman writer got the Nobel, uh, Olga Tork Torkachuk, um, I was thinking a lot of you, of your achievements, of her achievements, of your collaboration, and breaking through. If I remember well, she wasn't very much translated into English. Not very much, but uh, it's, it's getting there. Uh, and maybe you elaborate a little bit on how is it to penetrate, how, when it's taking off, how do you feel it? How did you approach it during your career, this kind of getting out of your own culture and become global or international? 
Um, you have do it. you hear me? Yeah, With, it's so tiny. <laughs> it's very delicate, but I think it works. Yeah, yeah, I hear myself. Um, so, thank you, Ada. I, you know, I, I, I want to start on the general note because the, the subject of the of the, our uh, meeting here is. Uh, and how from the smaller country to, to go with the cinema to the, to the global, global market, let's say. And um, I think that the most important, if, if Poland is a big country or a small country or middle-sized country or peripheral country or important country, very much depends on the perspective. But I will say that the country is as big as its culture is big. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the very few politicians understand it in this way, but I think they have to. And for me, like the example of miracle, um, it's uh, Iceland, which is a really tiny country, even in comparison with your country, which is not huge. It's like about 350,000 of um, citizens, which makes it the size of middle-sized Polish city. And, and they have the most um, creative uh, forces per capita, I, I, I can imagine. They have really good cinema uh, in Icelandic language. It is a very obscure language. And they have at least five, six films by year, and at least half of that is breaking through. They have great literature, fantastic music, you all know, Björk, etc., but it's much more of that. And they have probably the one of the best uh, football teams, so soccer team, which um, where the goal was um, not long time ago, the film director. So is, is it possible uh, to be known not only by beautiful landscape, but also by the creativity of the nation? So uh, if I have to have the appeal, it's to, to, to invest in talents to invest in the, in the creative forces, to invest in the filmmakers, and to invest really. It means uh, have the money for the development, uh, low-budget production, production, uh, script doctors, um, uh, screenwriters, writers, um, to put people together, to send the people abroad, you know, to, to do everything that you will have the cinema which is boiling. And the, 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 uh, the way to succeed is to have something really important to say, something which is yours, specific, which comes from your experience, your identity, but say it in the way which will translate to the universal language. And uh, coming back to Olga Tokarczuk, Tokarczuk who, is, um, who is a friend of mine and collaborator, because we did um, the movie together, Spur, based on her book, um, um, drive your plug, plug through the deaths of bones of dead. Yeah, that is the title. So I, 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 I changed it to the short one yeah. because no one was able to remember. It's a quote from William Blake poem. And um, Olga, um, Olga is, I think that she's wonderful, um, wonderful uh, writer. She's very talented, very original very different from other writers in the same time, communicative. She's, she's, she's choosing the storytelling and the subjects which are, which are sometimes quite obscure or quite um, um, eccentric, but um, she does it in the way that it really translates to our fears and our loves and our, our dreams. And, um, and always think to communicate um, her literary message to the, uh, to the readers, to be, to be close to the people, and not to be afraid to um, come out from her comfort zone and speak about the issues of the world, about politics, about ecology, about social issues, about the, you know, um, uh, about the others, and... Um, she was translated to English for quite a long time, but only recently her translation started to be uh, to, to, to have a bigger platform. She got um, some most important prizes, like Booker, Booker Prize. Prize, and the nominations for other and national award um, 
um, uh, of book, uh, and the most important um, uh, prize, literary prize um, in Sweden uh, for her 900 pages uh, historical book, uh, Jacob's uh, books. Uh, so, for a few last years, it was talked about her that she may be considered as a possible, possible um, a Nobel Prize. Um, and she had this um, Nobel Prize like a few days before the uh, elections, uh, the parliamentary elections in, in Poland, which uh, unfortunately opposition lost, but lost in the honorary way, I will say. So it gives some hope for, uh, for the future. Um, and she was not afraid to speak up openly what are her preferences just after uh, having the news about this prize, and she dedicated her prize to, uh, to the democracy in Poland, to Polish people. So uh, she's in the same time very her own, very special person, feminist and, um, and vegetarian, and, um, and at the same time she is um, uh, very political on the, on the global level, but she sees the politics as uh, some kind of the responsibility for the future. Exactly, uh, that's, uh, that's the idea and that's what I see in your positions and it's also something when, when I speak about, about Poland, I cannot ignore uh, Ida and Cold War that also made statements and they were controversial uh, at home. And that's, actually that's the, the question, you, you said that the politicians should sustain but did you feel that you were sustained, that your most important cultural figures in the country were sustained because they were opposants of the, of the power, most of them? Well, you know, it's, we are living in strange times when um, uh, you, um, it's, uh, some, the populist um, leaders and populist movements are raising, and one of the part of this populism is to put down the elites. It's very anti-elitic. Um, um, and the elitic movement, um, and also to put down the authorities, also cultural authorities. So, uh, when I'm receiving the prize, or when Olga receives Nobel, it's uh, a lot of people are incredibly happy. But at the same time, the half of the population is uh, it's, uh, it's immediately starting to to to, to the hateful speeches again. So we are unfortunately in this very polarized world right now. In, and many countries are really divided on half, which doesn't help the people like myself, um, because I try to do the, my movies, or Olga tries uh, to, to um, write her books, or Pavel Pawlikowski makes his films, or uh, Małgosia Szumowska, uh, to, 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 to bring people together somehow, to share the experience, share point of view, and uh, empathy, for very different kind of the perspectives. And in, um, when on the beginning of the process, immediately you are losing the half of your audience because they hate you personally, because the um, uh, ruling um, uh, power makes, um, uh, makes you some kind of the, of the gate scope, uh, gold, um, gold scope. That is, of course, very unfortunate because I, want, I don't want to not to close myself and don't to speak to the half of my country. I, I'm interested to speak to everybody. Of course, if you have some psychopaths or like open fascists, it's different, but I'm speaking about, about the people. The people are the people, right? <coughs> uh, so anyway, coming back to, you, uh, to your first question, um, I, I told invest, invest in talents. Uh, and um, uh, we all know that you can be successful as a filmmaker abroad, uh, rarely as an individual only, mostly if it's some wave of, the, of, of, your, of your local cinema, which is mm -hmm. taking you up mm -hmm. and bring you, you know. The wave, it was Romanian wave not lo a long time ago. It was Polish uh, wave in the 50s and then in the 70s with uh, mm -hmm. uh, Vajda Zanussi, Krzysztof Kieślowski, myself. Uh, and it helped me enormously when I was um, when I uh, found myself abroad as a, as a, a political refugee, uh, the, f the fact that I, I was known as a part of something of value, and also some of my films already made the big festivals because, um, because it was the interest 
for the cinema from my country, because this cinema was different, was, um, uh, had the qualities which which been original and powerful. And it was because I wasn't alone. I was with my older colleagues and my younger colleagues, and, um, and we've been like doing something which, 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 which was, everyone was different, but in the same time, we, 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 we felt some kind of the solidarity and we collaborated very closely together. Um, and Do you feel this solidarity today as being as strong as it used to be? It was the long period of, um, of the desert, and it was 80s and 90s. 80s because it was after martial law and it was some kind of depression, and this mm -hmm. generation, new generation, didn't have the place to come. And 90s because it was the transformation after the fall of the communism, which uh, was extremely st stupid time for the culture, because everybody believed that the market economy its what has to be your biggest idea about the world and that you can also subscribe the cinema or the art into the market economy. Of course, it doesn't work like that. And when you are considering market economy and you are from the um, country of few millions or even 30 millions, you cannot win. You cannot win uh, because you, you will never have enough or income from uh, your, your market, or your local market, to, mm -hmm. to make the successful cinema, and especially to make more innovative, more ambitious, or more personal cinema. Uh, and my colleagues have been naive. I was already after I, I, I lived uh, 10 years and worked 10 years in France and in UK and in Germany and the uh, US. So I knew that uh, you, it doesn't work this way. But they believe that they can just say market. And we are so good that we win the market. They've been very good, but the market was interested in, in, in this moment for some, uh, for some American um, uh, B cinema, rather. And uh, 90s was the moment when the Polish cinema practically disappeared. Um, and it came back with the new law about the cinema and the, institute, um, um, the Polish Institute, the Film Institute, which gave very logical and very, mm, mm, very ecological, I will say, way to finance the movies. It means the money, which has been quite, quite solid, came not from the uh, governmental budget, which always can be the, manipulated by some yeah. kind of the ideological political issues, but from uh, the uh, subjects which have been using uh, cinematic content, uh, audiovisual content, and paying back some percentage of their receipts, like the cinema, televisions, cables, um, uh, DVDs, everything, with what was, you know, what is on the market, um, uh, distribution companies, and so on. And this is so assuring on. the independence, yes. the political independence. Well, unfortunately, when you have the authoritarian government like now, who believes that they are the owners of the country, they can, they can break it. But so far, for four years, which have been pretty harsh for many institutions, um, culture and not culture institutions in Poland, the cinema reminded less or more independent. So, um, and we are, you know, we are, we are, we are raising. The last 10 years is really a good period, and it's many films which are made and especially a new generation of filmmakers is coming, and what makes me even the happier is a lot of women, and very talented women, are coming on the, on the, you know, on the, on the, to the cinema, and um, they are powerful. They are not like, when I was there, I was like practically alone. I have few colleagues, but they've been so shy that they didn't feel that they have to fight for, uh, for their vision. Um, and uh, the generation of filmmaker, women filmmakers now, they are fighting. They are the fighters and they believe that it's not the reason why the half of the humanity will be voiceless. So it's where we are, you know. I'm turning towards Katriel now as an employee of the Israeli filmmakers, as he is defining himself for many, many years. He has been an ambassador of Israeli cinema and also functioning as an agent for all kinds of talent uh, and technicians, doing matchmaking, traveling the world around in order to promote this um, 
the cinema of Israel, and also to put uh, to put uh, together co-productions and participation. And um, how do you see like, the small country of Israel that it's so present everywhere, especially when I'm looking into the art house circuit, really highly respected and very very present. What do you think it's the what what does it make it like so? Uh, <clears throat> okay, good afternoon. Um, there are a few elements. First of all, I believe it's the, it's the power of the stories. First of all, you have to have a film that will really be able to travel and so on. I believe that we had a kind of a rare combination in a way that we were lucky, or we are still lucky in a way, that we have very powerful stories. The stories which come from this very turbulent society in this very crazy country we live in. I believe that we managed to get a generation of uh, directors, most of, all of them trained in Israeli film schools, who <coughs> learn how to tell the story in a much more communicative way, if you like, in a much more engaging and touching way. And I believe that we have also a group of very skilled producers who learn how to deliver a film on time, on budget, etc. The combination of the three elements together, the power of the stories, the talent of the directors and the skills of the producers created a situation of films which managed to make the crossover and touch the hearts of many, many people in the world. This is one side of it. The other side of it was uh, the way I understood my role. I was for 21 years the head of the Israel Film Fund, which is like the main agency which finances everything and so on. And I thought that uh, we must be proactive we didn't have any unit which uh, dealt with promoting the Israeli cinema overseas. So I took it upon myself. So basically, I had to sell to the world the films which I decided to approve and to support. I couldn't hide behind anyone because I had to sell my own films in a way, if you like. So and the other thing was that I understood because of my history, I was a producer for 25 years that I cannot just sit idle. I have to reach out, reach out, go everywhere. And Israel being what it is, which is a, to a large extent the headache of the world, was really just to go out, whoever wanted to see us, whoever was ready to accept us, a small festival, a tiny one, a market, whatever. We are there with our films and just being out there, going out, reaching out, never, st not, never waiting for people to come to us. And this is a tremendous work, it's a lot of legwork and so on. I made it a point to take with me in all these years, wherever I went to all the festival, at least three, four, five producers who will come with me and I will introduce them to all the people and so on. I've been in this business for 48 years. I remember myself, I'll just tell you in one and a half minute, in 1975, when we had still 16 millimeter reels in the square boxes, and I never had enough money, so I would fly to Rome, and from Rome I would go with trains from one television station to the other, all the way to Wild E in Finland, trying to sell my lousy films. So basically, I lived in trains, and I used to stop in Frankfurt because they had a coin shower, take a shower, go down to the ZDF to sell my films. So I've been a hustler, and this has been my business as a producer for many years. So when I came to the fund, this whole hustling thing of being a producer, trying to sell my films since 75, I brought with me to the fund. But seriously, it's about work and about understanding your role. My, I understood my role that it's not enough that we manage to select maybe the right project and accompany the production and say putting money into manufacturing the films, if one can say so, and not putting enough money in to bring them into the world. So I decided that every single feature film that we support will, is entitled to a kit of about 20,000 euros only to venture out into the world, so that the producers will be able to do flyers and brochures and flights and this and that, so, and we are with them. In addition, we did a lot of umbrella initiatives, 
I used to print uh, my flyers and things about our films in all the languages in the world, Spanish, German, French, you name it, and so on, so that it will be easy access to everybody to know anything about our films. So it's like many, 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 many steps all along and all the time with the filmmakers, all the time introducing them and so on. My mailing uh, before I left the fund, which was just three months ago, was about 3,500 people from all over the world with whom we were constantly in touch and so on. It, go it, it grows throughout the years, it accumulates, it's a lot of work, but the bottom line is that uh, somehow we managed to do it with four nominations to the final five in the Oscars, with Golden Bears and Golden Lions and I don't know whatever you want. So somehow it seemed to be working. Also the numbers in the, in the international market, because if we have an Israeli movie which sells 700,000 tickets in Paris, it means that it somehow works. It, it, it works in a way, and we have had quite a number of films like that. So, but at the end of the day, it's really about getting the producer to be much more proactive, getting them to really to match them together with the sales agents, with distributors, and really working all over the world. I was in Melbourne and Sydney and doing Israeli film weeks in endless number of countries just to do it, that's all. It's work. Yeah, so I'm getting back to the things that I was mentioning this morning. Actually, it's consistency, creativity, and I think also solidarity, I would put it in. Yeah. And uh, turning towards Julie, we are touching a different kind of situation where someone is coming from a big country, but it's not a big uh, well, player, it's, it's an independent player, and is facing probably most of the challenges that we are facing as independents coming from smaller countries, and uh, maybe some different ones, especially because you do have the language that is circulating, you might have some of the talent stars and so on. What's missing? What's, what's the challenge for you? Well, the UK is actually quite a small country geographically, but it's got rather a lot of people and they're all rather content hungry. But I work um, in the independent sector, i.e. I don't make studio movies, or I don't, I'm not a producer for the studios. Um, I mostly do films for the cinema, and I work across all independent budget levels. So that means either working with brand new talent, which I really enjoy discovering new filmmakers. And obviously when you're discovering a new filmmaker, you've got to make something at quite a low level to much bigger stuff. But we face exactly the same problems. It's like the independent problem is the same as coming from a smaller territory with an, um, that's non-English speaking, because we're always fighting with the availabilities and how to raise the money. So first of all, I will go to a financing meeting, for example, uh, with, let's say, a sales, usually a sales agent or a distributor or a fund or whatever, and the first question they'll say to me was, is, well, what's the film? Okay, who's in it? <laughs> and I mean, I've been to meetings with Lionsgate where I'll say, oh, we're planning on having this person playing the lead, and they go, get me Gerard Butler, get me Ger J uh, Jason Statham, and we'll give you the money. Well, neither of those actors are at all right for that particular film. You know, so you, I'm constantly facing this, this battle of, um, it's not even about getting the films into the marketplace. You've got to get the film financed in the first place to make the film, to get it into the marketplace. And um, I'm very used to... Uh, putting together the financing from a lot of different places, and I have done a lot of international co-productions. Um, but, the, but the challenge is always making it at the right budget level for the material and the potential audience, and trying to get a level of cast that will give it some recognition. I don't want Gerard Butler or Jason Statham necessarily, um, but also I probably wouldn't get them on this film because they're doing unbelievable numbers of studio films where they earn six times what I'm paying. Um, and certainly, even if they liked it, their agent wouldn't let them do it, probably. So I'm, you know, it's not a different problem, really, to um, being a, 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 from, a, from a small market. It's, it's still a, 
a, a major problem to make independent films and get, their, get them out there. And even if you can get the money together, you've then got to get it to market. And that's the other tricky point, because it has to be really, really good. And it has to stand out and be very different from everything is, that's out there. So then I'm coming back to repeating what everyone else is saying. It's about having a voice. It's about filmmakers being brave enough to stick with their own voices and create memorable films that are not trying to emulate American films. Because why are we doing that when there's plenty of Americans doing that, for example? So. Yeah. Got it. Um, and how do, you, how do you see the future, getting to the, to the topic of this morning, how do you see the future from, from a British independent perspective? Do you, how, how do you see shifting the, uh, the theatrical? Is it still something that it should be there in order for a film to exist? Or it can go only streaming? Or how, how, do, how, how is perceived today this? That, that's a really interesting question because I think it actually depends what the project is and who the audience for that project is ultimately. Um, but um, I love going to the cinema and I love watching films and I love watching them with other people, lots of other people around me because part of enjoying the film is also taking in the atmosphere of how everyone else is reacting to it. And I love it when we make films. I always go to quite a lot of the early screenings to see how people are reacting. You know, are they laughing? Are they crying? Are they walking out? You know, um, so I think that's still, I, and I don't think that is going to go away. Um, but the streaming issue is, is really quite worrying. I've got a, a specific example. I've just made, um, of, by independent standards, quite an expensive independent movie. And it's actually a family movie. It's called Four Kids in It. And I'm just, I've just delivered it, and it's going to start screening at the AFM in November for potential distributors. So at the moment, I don't know what's going to happen to it in terms of who's going to release it, where. Um, but I'm having quite a big conflict with the sales agent because it's the easy option for the sales agent to sell it to a streamer. Um, and the streamer will pay a, a fairly okay amount of money for it, but that's it, end of story. It can't go anywhere else. And we made this film for a, a substantial family audience. Uh, there's lots of things about this particular story and the book that it's based on and the author of that book and, um, that give it the potential to have a life in a lot of different media uh, for a very long time. So, and we really want it to be on the big screen because we also know that there is a massive audience in the school holidays because it's specifically aimed at kids, um, principally up to the age of 11, but there's loads in it for their parents and their grandparents. You know, it's a proper family film. And there's, um, there's a really big opportunity, but the sales agent is saying, well, we've got this offer from a streamer, so we should just take it, because that's easy. They only have to do one deal then. So, you know, you never stop facing issues all the way through the process. But on, I, I find that on every film, the, the issues, the challenges are all different. Mm. Yeah, we were speaking about voices. And uh, Shelley, you are... <laughs> discovering, picking, developing <coughs> relations with voices from so different cultures, from India to Russia, from China to Australia, uh, coming back to the Baltics. Uh, how, how, how do you feel that, how, how do you tickle, how you, how you pick the voices that you think that it can transcend the, the, their original culture and make a difference and break through in the big markets? Yes, it's an interesting question. I was thinking, listening to everyone else, I come from such a different perspective, having worked for one of the biggest Hollywood studios for 
25 years, um, that everything was about macro audiences. So the family film, it must offend no one. You know, it must be understandable in all these different cultures. But uh, in recent years, I've been working with uh, studios in different places, as you say, and I find myself constantly recommending them to say something that means something to you. And that includes the students. I do a lot of teaching, um, particularly in China, where they have an issue with creativity uh, because it's a very different education system there. And I'm always telling the students who copy ideas that they've seen elsewhere, typically say something that is important to you because if you say it truthfully, actually it will reach everyone instead of just something generic. So um, at the moment I'm working with a, a wonderful group uh, of writers and directors in Australia who have a very small project by DreamWorks standards with a budget only of about 10 million, which might sound large here, but for my world, it's lunch money. Um, and I keep saying to them, the reason I'm attracted to their project is the script, which has this really wonderful Australian, quirky, slightly sarcastic quality. And I, I perceive that if they uh, work with people who are very, uh, desirous of getting their project to the largest audiences, they will try and erase some of that to smooth down the edges, to make it more universally family friendly. And I'm kind of against that. So my feeling is that the films that I love, a really good example from two years ago, one of my all-time favorite animated films is Ma Vie de Courgette, mm -hmm. My Life as a Zucchini. Mm -hmm. Lovely film. The director is somebody I've loved for years and years and years and struggled enormously to make that film on a tiny budget. And it, it really spoke to everybody. I remember sitting in an audience full of producers, I think Vilnius was there, uh, watching a first screening of that. And we were all crying, you know, really tired old, you know, professionals. We were so moved by this little film. So yeah, I feel... It's a feel 65 minutes film. It's not something that... Uh, Exactly. I mean, they ran out of money. It was the budget was so low. So I agree also with what Catriel was saying. It's passion. You know, you want to find a project that the director feels passionate about and taking it to the other extreme. If you come back to How to Train Your Dragon, which I was involved with from the beginning too, um, the passion of the director, Dean Dubois, for that project. He just lived that project for 10 years. And I think that comes across. To me, that's my favorite of all the DreamWorks movies. And it doesn't feel like a multiple of studio voices are crowding into the creative process. It feels like a vision from a single director. And, and in Hollywood movies, that's unusual because normally it's made by a whole committee of producers and executive producers and executive, executive, executive producers. Mm -hmm. and everybody has uh, an influence. And sometimes, I mean, a, a really good example recently, which I wasn't involved with personally, um, is the movie that's just been released from Pearl, which was a, before Oriental Dreamworks, uh, Abominable. Um, and the issue with a movie that's made in this case for an audience which has to reach both family audiences in China and in the USA, uh, the problem with that is humor. Because as soon as you start working on something where you have two really different cultures who laugh at different things, um, we realized very quickly when we were working with China that the humor, the comedy, was going to be an issue. So with Kung Fu Panda, not only the dialogue was redubbed for China, but the jokes were changed. And they did the same thing with Abominable. Now, this requires a huge budget. I mean, as soon as you start remaking your film for different audiences, that is a really big investment, an additional investment. So for a smaller yeah. project, it would be hard to do that. And I think it's that. not only a huge budget, but a really intimate cultural cooperation yes. in order to, 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 to build this and to have the mm. two faces and to balance and to teach. Yes, Katri, you want, you want to add something? Carry on, carry yeah. on, carry on. But I do think it's very important because I've sat for 20 years through pitches of presentations and screenings of films um, in animation films uh, where the film says we have an English script 
But what they mean is they have a German or a Dutch or a Flemish or a French script which has been translated into English, mm. which is not the same thing at all. So if you think of uh, a film coming from, say, Ardman, which has a very particular style of humor, it's essentially British, it's hard to imagine American writers working on that kind of very familial, uh, specific kind of humor. Um, but that humor also doesn't always travel. I mean, Ardman films are wonderful, but they don't always reach the biggest box office numbers in America, for example. So coming back to the point, how does a project from you know, a smaller or more specific region or a specific culture reach the largest audience? I feel it's that emotional connection with the material. Um, you see films like The Prophet and films that are made um, in Israel, in, in France also, that do have this very personal quality. They maybe won't make the same box office figures as a Disney movie, but that mean, doesn't mean they're any less successful to me as a result. So I think you have to quantify what your desired market is. And if by reaching a very receptive audience all around the world is your uh, gauge of success, then I would say it has to be something that feels authentic. If it's to reach a really mass market, then you're making a movie by numbers. Mm -hmm. And you need, you know, like X, Y, Z as part of the elements, and then you can get the right person to back it, and then you can reach your market. But those kind of movies don't interest me as much these days. I see. Okay, and now I have a question for all of you from your perspective. What would you recommend to a filmmaker, producer or director, filmmaker, that would like to break through coming from a country like Romania or Latvia, coming from this kind of territories? to do nowadays? Would you recommend rather to, uh, to go and be present in the, uh, in the networking events and to try to, to, to do a collaboration, a European collaboration? Would you, um, uh, would you recommend to go towards the, the new players and go into the series? Would you, what, what would you recommend? Well, it's a game. Assuming that it has a voice. It has something to say and it's talented. Well, if, it is a, if we talk about movies, feature films, not series for the moment, for a moment, um, then I can say when, we have, we, when I was asked to become the head of the fund, we had to reinvent ourselves and reintroduce the Israeli cinema to the world. I personally, I know that we are all talking about co-productions and co-productions and co-productions. For me, it's not a magic formula. I had for many years a lot of questions about co-productions and so on, even though I greenlighted throughout my years, uh, authorized more than 300 movies, I would say about 80, 85 were international co-productions. But when we were in the moment of reintroducing ourselves, I really suggested and did the matchmaking of our films with partners in the world, not because of money, but because of raising the visibility and maybe putting the film on another pedestal. So if I think about 2001, many years ago with Late Marriage and all these films, we were looking for co-producing partners and I did this matchmaking not because the movie needed extra money or finances, but because it has a French co-producer and a German co-producer and this and that, I thought that this will help the film get a much bigger international visibility. So I would say that um, one of the ways is really to find these partnerships and this collaboration with partners throughout the world, not always because I need more money or I need certain facilities, but also because it can also raise a little your exposure and your visibility. You know, you know better than me that uh, Europe produces more than 1,500 films a year. And in order to really stand out and be at all noticed, you have to do a tremendous amount of work. The more partners you have with you on board, it will help you do this work. It will help you to do this work. And it will help you also to reach out to sales agents. And you know, at the end of the day, we all know here, I know quite a number of people here, 
for our type of movies, we talk about what 12, 15 cents agents that deal with this kind of things we make, not even maybe 15, and I don't know how long they will last. But at least for the moment, this is what we have. So to get to them and to make them see your film and decide to embark on your project and act as your sales agent, it's not easy, but the more partners you have, it will help in a way. Thank you. Yes. Um, I think that um, for producers, I think that's a very good thing. Uh, I, I am, I'm all for collaboration, and I think all sorts of networking events like this and the many networking events at different festivals and markets around the world are vital because our business is initially about who you know as a producer, um, who you know and who will give you some more contacts and who you can talk to. Obviously, you've then got to step up to the plate and uh, stand by what you say you're going to do. As a director, I think um, it's important to just, um, when you're starting out, make lots of shorts, get as much experience as possible, get, you know, try to get those shorts into festivals. <coughs> um, and also, I think, some, do something at home as a director to start with. Um, which hopefully will then start to get you know, a, a festival mm -hmm. life, people start to notice you, um, and then things will go from there. And, and unfortunately, all the talent usually gets scooped up to Hollywood <laughs> and then either disappears <laughs> or becomes very famous. Um, but that, that's the way it goes. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, just get to know as many people as possible and certainly when you're doing co-productions and working together I personally have um, I sort of go with my guts I always want to meet the people who I might be working with face to face and look them in the eyes um, you know I for me that's a super important part of the process I think I've only ever I've done quite a few co-productions and I've only probably one person I would never, ever, ever work with again. Um, and it was someone who uh, was recommended to me by the director um, and um, I hadn't met. And because it was the director, we went, okay, let's do this. And then I met him and I thought, oh my word, what have I done? <laughs> and unfortunately, I was proven right in the, in the long term. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, what, for me, it's really important <coughs> to build relationships. And I would like to build relationships that it will continue. So, I mean, I've, you know, if I want to do a film in <coughs> various territories, I, should, I hope to have a, a go-to producer to work with who I, you know, I really like in those territories. Yeah, so the human, the human level that I was really mentioning cool. also, it's, Absolutely. again, very, very important. And I do believe in this, that nothing can be preset in this kind of business. Mm. It's really a, such a personal level that should, mm. uh, should go like that. Please, Agnieszka. But, uh, you know, I wanted to, to speak about a production from the, from the filmmaker point of view, which is slightly mm. different. Uh, Mostly, it doesn't make sense for the filmmaker, this co-production issue. I know that we have to do it because um, I agree. every European countries are too small uh, in, 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 in money to, 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 uh, to, let, um, to allow to make the film which has slightly bigger budget. And um, you need the partners which comes with from another funds and so. But because mostly they are not like private money, they are not the money that somebody invests, the financiers or whoever, because believes in the project. But mostly the, this complication game of different funds. Um, if it's not really logical from the creative point of view, it ends in some some way of no man's land because you know you you. First, you, you, you have to work with the people you normally will not work with um, on, the, on, the, on the basis of the, of the story or, of, um, or, the, or the language. You, have, you are doing, for example, Polish film and you have to hire some German actors because you need German talents, because if not, you will not, etc., have German television. Um, then you have to dub them, then you have, you know, to, to do something which... Sometimes it's great and sometimes you have great people, but not always it makes sense. The location is the same, not always it makes sense to shoot something in this or this country. You are doing it because that some local fund is giving you the money. But the most uh, dangerous it is that you have to... Um, 
to pass through the, through the selection of different tastes. And those phones have their agenda and their taste, which not always are the tastes which are mine. And um, a lot of filmmakers, especially the young filmmakers, is doing script regarding the taste of the pounds they, they, are, they, are, they are aiming. And I think that some kind of the mediocrity of European cinema, and I think that we produce a lot, too much, and that too much of that is mediocre, is because it is always the compromise with different tastes and the different, different, the different places. So, uh, co-production, yes, it has this advan uh, advantage, as you say, Catriel, that you, it, can, it can give you the collaboration and connection and help of the people which will help to raise the film and bring it to the festivals or to the, to the foreign markets. But uh, in, in the same time, um, it's great if you find the co-production which really helps the film and the filmmaker. Which comes natural, which is kind natural, which calls for a natural way of a co-production. And as I said, for me, it was never a magic formula. Because at the end, it's about the creative freedom of the people who initiated the project and how much they can stick to the film that they initially set out to do. Yeah, but here I think I will, I will come back also to, to something that, uh, that Julie was mentioning, because I think precisely to avoid the traps that, uh, that you were mentioning, Agnieszka, I think that you need a strong producer that really believes and is defeating the real structure, the real needs, and then it comes the other thing, the partners that you have that are also believing in the film that you are doing together, and it's not just checking boxes towards funds or financiers in order to get the money. And of course, it's a, it needs skills to manage to, to do this balance, but sometimes, like for instance, I'm, I'm doing now a film with a, um, it's a Romanian, Swedish, Bulgarian, German co-production, debut feature, um, with a one million budget. It's a difficult task. But I will have a German composer that I would have never dreamed to have. And at a level that I don't have in Romania. And that's really something that it works for the film. It's someone that was picked before we had the money from, from Germany. And, it, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, there are these kind of encounters that, uh, that are functioning, but it needs to, to be done with a, with a soul again and with brains and, and also with a vertical uh, mm -hmm. spine. I think that, um, I totally agree with, with what you're saying um, from a creative point of view. And a problem with our business is every project is different and you've got to build it from the ground upwards. There's no formula in independent filmmaking. Um, and you can't force something. It's like putting, um, what, what's the saying, putting a round peg into a square hole, or maybe it's the other way around. Um, you know, you, it's got to work for what you're trying to do. And if it's going to interfere with the creativity, then that's surely you have to find another way to do it, basically. But it's about feeling passionate about the project and finding another way, because there is no right and wrong way to do anything. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Can please, I Shelley? just bring the subject back to something Agnesha said right at the beginning, and it was in one of the earlier panels as well, the issue of investment in the skill sets mm -hmm. and you know the question is how do you bring a project from a smaller society cultural background into a larger market for me it's about the schools and i spent half my life in animation schools all around the world and all of the centers of excellence that have been established in places like paris have been the springboard for the success of the industry at present and that applies everywhere so i would say you know one of the things it's really necessary to invest in we've been hearing about it's difficult to find sufficient people to 
to build a project locally without going the co-producer route, um, I would say that's one thing that needs to be addressed for sure, um, particularly in the case of animation, which is so labor intensive and skills intensive. Um, so, you know, any kind of cooperation with visiting professionals from outside into the schools and particularly work experience, that came up I think yesterday or today somebody was talking about that, the ability for the students to go and practice within a professional yeah. environment. If the educational structure supports a more fine art approach to filmmaking, this is, for me, a problem we have in the UK, which is a whole other conversation. Um, and the idea is everybody is an auteur. Uh, that's wonderful up to a point, but it doesn't create the different levels of skills that you really need in the industry for the industry to grow and develop. So it's something I feel very passionate about. I also travel the world <laughs> constantly talking. And about 20 years ago, I was telling all my friends in London about these wonderful French students. And they were like, no, 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 we don't want to hire the French. We'll just hire. And now every London studio is half full of wonderful French animators, without which we couldn't have made half of the amazing projects that you've seen in visual effects and animation. And it's down to the level of education. So for me, that's one of the really important factors in creating a really successful local industry, is having that skill coming out of the younger you know, graduates. Thank you very much. I, I, I agree with you completely, Katri. Well, I just wanted to bring up um, something which may sound a little not very popular, but still, I think that um, it's the issue of the festivals. You know, for many of us, the reality will be, or for some of us, the reality will be that our films, probably the only life they will have, they will have in the festivals, uh, whether we like it or not, I'm not saying for everybody, but quite a number of films, this will be their life. And honestly, I have an issue with the festivals, and because I think, and this has to do with us, maybe the film funders or others, because I think that uh, if I'm a director and I made a film and the film went to 10, 15, 20 festivals, and you're in all these festivals, let's say 25,000, 30,000, 20, 15,000 watch my films, I would like to have it as a line in my CV, but I don't get the reports and they're not transparent, mm. and I don't know how many people watch my films, etc. Most of the festivals are publicly funded, or at least in part, and I think they should be by far much more transparent. And if I take it on the financial side, and I think about the films which I know for a fact, that you know Toronto <laughs> provides you five screenings, so if we do the smallest calculation and we say the ticket is $10 and 3,000 people watch my film is $30,000. And if it was in Berlin, it will be 30,000 euros or something like that. Okay, so they invite me, they invite the director, they give me four nights and the badge. Everything is beautiful, $1,500. Forgive me that I speak money for a moment, but you know I'm a producer. So, um, so... Honestly, I really believe that if the life of our films is, to some of our films will be the festival life, I believe that the festival mm -hmm. should be much more accountable. I believe, I'm not saying they should, should, they should share with us all the revenues, but I believe that we will eventually have to come to an agreement with the festivals. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds of festivals. Mm -hmm. Some of them are the A festivals, which I mentioned. The others, uh, you may ask for a screening fee and so on. But if this is becoming, whether we like it or not, a kind of an auxiliary market, mm -hmm. A, a kind of a market for some of our films, even in the coming future, with the streaming services and so on, they should be much more transparent, much more accountable, and you know what, even share with us a little bit of the money they make. Yeah, but I can tell you, for instance, for a film like Aferim, that was really traveling heavily in festivals, only in festivals and special events, we got over 40,000 euros. Accounted by our international sales agent very openly. I haven't seen a penny because I wasn't clever enough <laughs> to split the, this uh, and uh, we just discuss it. I didn't sign it that it's 50-50. So I haven't seen a penny, but the, the numbers they were reporting. It's just the, the, the screening fees and so, not Screening tickets. fees. So yeah. this is only the screening fees. Only the screening fees. 
Streaming fees, yes. If you have 100 festivals and you charge 750 euros for each of these 100 festivals, you get some money back, which allows the filmmaker maybe to help him to develop his new project. I'm not saying for pure profit, but also for the director, and if especially for the director and the writer to be able in the resume to say, yes, my project, my film traveled to so many festivals and so many people watched it. It's nice to have it in the CV, and not all the festivals are transparent and accountable. Mm. Well, there we are coming to the question of sales agents, which are like instrumental for the success, international success of the film. But in the same time, I worked with several, um, and mostly I tried to, to serve the film as much as possible, but I had similar feeling that, you know, um, the, if you have European um, uh, personal, um, a non-commercial film, the festivals are a very important part of their distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, because they, we know very well how difficult it is to sell um, the film to the another country, to the commercial distribution, and even if so, the income is mostly very limited, except of some break, uh, breakouts like, you know, like the film you mentioned, Israeli film, or, or like Pavel Pavlikovsky's Ida, or something like that. So, um, and sales agents are mostly pushing you to go to some festivals. Then they tell you that this festival will be important, this one, no. I don't see the logic, frankly. I'm, I'm, I'm traveling with my luggage, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> meeting all those like local journalists, mostly from quite obscure medias, and uh, talking to the audience, which is interesting for me, of course, that is a really like important experience. Uh, but I don't feel that it translates somehow to the, to the real sales of the films, or very rarely. But uh, you don't feel that it translates in the sales, but in the awareness about the film? Don't you feel the differences? Well, you know, I think it means I'm not meeting the local distributors, you know, I'm meeting audiences. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know exactly. I'm, I don't want to go to the details, you know, but I don't feel that the sales agents are really following it. I don't feel that they really make the work after, and they do something to let, for example, the important media to come, to make them aware, to make some kind of the promotion tools for this festival to, um, to, 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 to attract this kind of the interest. It's mostly me, myself, doing my job of the sales agent, you know? Uh, and, um, and at the same time, I don't have the tools because I don't know local market. If I have the distributor there already, that is, of course, easier because it's his job to make the, to make the work. But if it's not the distributor there in place, or he is not interested enough to show at this festival, because it often happens that for the distributor, this festival is not so important. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that the sales agents, they, they are a little showing me, a bit like the agents, like the talent agents, who are like sending you the useless material to just to show that they are working, they are working. for you. Mm -hmm. So the sales agents are sending you to different, you know, uh, festivals just to show that they are so important and they are working for the film. I think it's even more, uh, more easy. They, yeah. they send you to some of the festivals that are paying a bigger uh, uh, fee for the ah. screening. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. Um, no, and then, but then I think that there are festivals, and I, I've been looking uh, on the transformation, for instance, of a festival like Carlo Vivari in the last years and what it meant for the region, the, the presence of Karel Och, and the way he redesigned the festival, like really, like a, the, the, the phoenix bird out of the ashes, and, and bringing media over there, and bringing awareness, and creating, I mean, I was very surprised, like five years ago, if I would have said, uh, I would have told someone, uh, some of the sales agents, well, you know, we've been selected in the competition in Carlo Vivari, they would have said, yeah, well, mm, let me see the film. Uh, last year, I've seen quite a couple of the uh, main art house uh, sales agents really like making, breaking news, we have two films in the competition in Carlo Vivari. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. this means that it sells. Actually, that's what it means. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. that from the certain point. Yeah, but that is a, a yeah, 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 yeah. That was an, an example. Then uh, the, yeah. the alternative. And I, is I've been the jury at this festival like probably six, seven years ago, and it was the suffering for me as a juror. You know, it maybe was two films, watchable <laughs> films, and the rest was. So, um, uh, but you know, I, 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 I know, I see because I'm following the, you know, the, the, the this region and, and country and so, yeah, it's, it, it, it really depends on the person, yeah. frankly. It's management, it's management. It's like earlier we were discussing about, uh, about the production services and uh, incentives and uh, stage uh, studios availability or not and crew and this and that. But I think the most important is the level of management and the confidence and, that... And passion. And passion, absolutely, and passion. Oh my God, we are out of time. Uh, shall I yeah. open the floor for one, two? How many questions am I allowed? Three? Uh, one. <laughs> one. Okay. We have, a, we have afterwards networking, so other okay. questions. Okay. In the one minute. question. One question. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Stop! 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 <laughs> stop! Stop! <laughs> Okay, do we have questions in the house? Because uh, this will be a really exclusive question. The rest <laughs> no, that's okay. That's yeah, okay. please. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Microphone is coming here. Yeah, yeah I'm Rahul Jain from India. Uh, I think uh, since yesterday, India has not been mentioned once. So I understand the importance <laughs> of films that we give and the kind of films we get. Agni Aska was there, so she was, uh, her name is Zola. She was from Poland, lived in England, and talked about Iceland. So, my question is how to get big films from bigger countries like India with the numbers to smaller countries. Ah. <laughs> That's a tough one. Bravo. Katri, your call. <laughs> I think that uh, it doesn't really matter. The size doesn't really matter in this case. And I think that you heard about Iceland. At the end of the day, I know a little about India. I know about, not Bollywood, but the, the, what's called the art house Indian movies. I was in Goa more than once. But I think at the end is really how proactive you as a filmmaker, you as a producer, you as the one who put the neck on the line three, four years to make this film, is ready to engage yourself and not give it to a sales agent or to a distributor for adoption, like a little baby which is finally born, you give it for adoption. If you are there with your film and you care about it and you are on the neck of the sales agent every single day and you are there fighting for your movie, then it will happen. It will happen. Eventually it will happen. At the end of the day, it's really how proactive you want to be as a filmmaker and how much do you care about your movie. Because if you say to yourself, I got my producer's fee or my director's fee, I got a little bit of the, from the MG that the sales agent gave me and shalom, I don't need any more to do anything, let him do the job, I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong. I think you should be there fighting for your film and be there all the time and not just let the sales agent, the, the distributors do the job and that's it and I'm already in my next movie. And this is for me always has been. Because for me, the main question, whose film is it anyway? And who controls the faith and the destiny of your movie? Honestly, I believe the people who put the neck on the, on the line to make this film three, four years, it's their movie. And they should be there in all the decision making and try to do the work that they, I think they should really do. But I have to say, also, as someone who is very passionate about Indian films, uh, you're hardly unknown. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was just yesterday talking to somebody in Hollywood about Paheli. Remember that film? That made it to the Oscars. So it's not as if you are an unknown quantity. So it's being visible. It's being visible at festivals. It's sending, you know, trailers to people, really encouraging people to be excited about your project. And unfortunately, in the kind of Hollywood sense, saying, it's like, you know, it's like Ravana or it's like, I don't well, know, Amal Akbar or something like that, and encouraging them to be excited about it in advance. I mean, I'm saying this from a very Hollywood point of view because I'm constantly telling people to look at films uh, like that. Um, but I do think you do have to, as uh, you were saying, do a lot of self-promotion just to get it visibility. Uh, thank you, thank you very much at this point.
One more time, huge applause. Agnieszka Holland, Julie Baines, Katriel Shuri, Shelley Page, and Ada Salomon. Thank you very much indeed.